Welcome to the Grief Dreams Podcast, where we have conversations with guests about their life, loss, grief, and of course, grief dreams, which can be dreams of the deceased. If you want to know more about the topic and your hosts, please visit our website at griefdreams.ca. To support our podcast, please go ahead and rate it. For additional ways to support us, please refer to our show notes. Before we move on with the show, we'd like to give a territory acknowledgement. Long before Canada was formed, the Stalo people were the original land stewards, and they have lived here since time immemorial. They continue to live in the unceded Stalo territory, known to settlers as the Fraser Valley and Lower Fraser Canyon of British Columbia. We recognize and honor the contribution that Indigenous people have made and continue to make to our community and the topic of grief dreams. All right, welcome to the Grief Dreams podcast. Thank you again for tuning in and being here. So today, uh, your hosts will be Jade and myself, Joshua, and our special guest is Emily Bevan. Emily is a writer and actor, perhaps best known for her role as spirited zombie Amy Dyer in the BAFTA winning series In the Flesh. She is soon to appear on Disney Plus and Hulu in the hotly anticipated TV series of the much-loved film The Full Monty. Other credits include Funny Woman, Doc Martin. Temple, Grant Jester, Domina, and many more. In the run-up to her father's untimely death in 2014, Emily kept a diary of thoughts, feelings, anecdotes, and poems as a way of keeping sane. These diaries were published by Unbound in 2022 in the form of The Diary of Losing Dad, and releasing them to the world has been a hugely cathartic experience. Emily is delighted to join us here on the podcast today and have an opportunity to reflect on her journey and remember her dad. Thank you, Emily, so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. So you wrote this whole book that really you know, focused on these diaries. Have you kept diaries before as a child and this was just like a continuation or is this something new for you? Um, so I've always um, written poetry and that's always been something that I've lent on when things have been a bit difficult. I also like to write poems for family members or, you know, if it was someone's birthday, I might make up a silly poem. So words are definitely a thing for me that I kind of lean on as a bit of a crutch. But around the time of my dad's death, I had been keeping a diary. Uh, it was roughly around the time that we we knew that his renal cancer had come back. He'd had a, a kidney removed a few years before. And then it was, yeah, it was after it came back that I sort of started keeping a notebook and just using it as a way of like scribbling down normally a little poem to sort of make sense of what was going on in my life at that time or you know thoughts about dad and you know what a massively significant figure he was in my life and I kind of kept that going because it was an interesting time there was sort of interesting things going on work-wise and I have this lovely older friend who's an actress who talks about keeping a diary and she always told me to sort of write anecdotes a little observation or sometimes a little poem. And, and I and I like that as an idea. And it's a sort of way of kind of remembering things. So I was keeping a diary at the time that my dad completely out of nowhere had a had a stroke, which we later found out was caused by his renal cancer. Yeah, I I, I had this diary and it was it was just a pretty fragmented, you know, diary, which when I came to write it up became much more, you know, lucid and I, I kind of shaped the narrative much more but it was in its raw state kind of just full of details about the hospital details about dad you know people that we'd met in the hospital people in the next door beds how I was feeling um uh, yeah so it was so it was something that I'd kind of done before because poetry has always been a part of my life and um I studied English and and one of my modules was a was a poetry writing module and I that kind of set me off again later on in life but yeah, th- this is the biggest diary I've I've ever kept. And I haven't kept one since, interestingly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. And so it's got to be kind of interesting looking back through the diary when you had a chance to, because I can only imagine going through such heartache and, and pain mm-hmm. and suffering, you forget some of the stuff that you actually went through and the people you've met. And so what was that yeah. like to reflect back on, I guess, even writing the book to reflect back on some of the things that you actually experienced or went through or thought about? It was a, it was a really cathartic thing, and I and I and I I didn't do I didn't go there I didn't I couldn't go there for a, a, at least a couple of years. Um, I after Dad died, I got quite busy with work, and um, as someone told me, you know, to keep busy and you'll be fine, you'll keep yourself together, which is one sort of kind of way of approaching grief, maybe not the best, but I I really like was 
flat out with um you know work and life and living and going away and trying to sort of you know keep myself busy because if you keep yourself going you don't really have much time to think about it and it was when i met my my now husband billy who loves traveling and he persuaded me to go away to india for a couple of months together on this sort of bit of an adventure which felt really huge after this kind of period of like you know being on the little wheel um and it was when i kind of really slowed down and all i had to think about was you know what we were going to eat or what where we were going to stay that night it all kind of came flooding up like it was like actually if you run away and you you know keep yourself busy it doesn't go away it's just all there but you just haven't given it the space and on that trip i started listening listening to um a podcast called grief cast i don't know if you're familiar with that but that's one of the ones in the uk that's very popular and just listening to people talking about their stories and you know their experiences and people that they'd lost made me think about my own story and how i really wanted to sort of think about it and go back there and so when we got back from our trip i wrote the first draft and you know it, it was all in this pink notebook that i still have and a couple of other notebooks as well but i mean that was the work that was the kind of grieving process that sort of i mean obviously when i you know most of the time i was pretty i found it quite uncomfortable to talk about dad up to that point you know and i could see it in other people's eyes people that had lost parents or lost you know anyone they they talk to me and i'd be kind of they they just have so much in their eyes and I found it really uncomfortable and I didn't want to let myself go there because I wasn't ready. But then, of course, in private, I would have these moments of just profound, like, despair because it's just such a huge thing, isn't it? It's like, it's, you know, especially in those early months and, and years, like, it's it's like, I remember describing it as being like this huge wall and you're right there next to it and you can't even make out the scale of this wall because it's so enormous. And um, it's only with time when you can come back, you can sort of make out the, the, there's a sort of shape to it. And it's like you can find the words, you know, you can. Yeah. But that, in those early months, it's just too profound. And so you can't think about it all the time. Otherwise, you go mad. I think I think Alan de Botton, he says something like, um, yeah, like like grief is is kind of like it's something along the lines of not thinking about it. Otherwise, nothing makes sense. And um, so that was me. And then, yeah, going through the book, I was I was writing it and I, I didn't have children at that time, but I ended up writing quite a lot at night. I don't know why. And um, and just pouring with tears. And there were certain very painful bits about it that I found really hard. And, you know, I did draft after draft after draft. And even, you know, to my final draft, there was a bit of it that I still, you know, found really hard to read, which was the day of my dad's death. Um, when I'd, you know, done the thing that you do where you sort of become very stressed and emotional and you kind of leave the hospital not knowing that you're never going to see them again. And then, you know, my phone was on silent. My mum was trying to call me and I did. I was there when he died. And I'm so, so grateful that I was there and I experienced the moment of him, his death, which was a beautiful moment. And I just knew that he'd gone. It was extraordinary, really, like just an energetic thing that just shifted. And it was like... And he was gone. I'm sure. I don't know if you look. You're like you maybe had a similar experience, Jade. You, yeah, it's um, extraordinary. And and um, but I didn't say goodbye. There was no kind of goodbye. But yeah, I, I it, that was very painful to me because I was very very close to him. But I think you know what comforted me is the fact that Dad had been in hospital for a couple of months after he had a stroke, and actually he died from pneumonia in the end. It was, you know, something that he was very, very weak and his cancer was everywhere. And um, that was what got him in the end. And I, uh, but yeah, I just really regretted that. That felt very childish and very selfish and to have kind of gone off in a half about something tiny, you know, um, a dis, you know, dispute with my mom about a flannel. I think it was about, you know, tiny, um, but, you know. I've been comforted by the fact that a lot of people go off to get a cup of tea or they, you know, it's the day that they have to go and they wanted a sandwich and then they miss, you know, miss it. And like, no, no, no death, I think is perfect. I mean, some are, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was an incredible it was I, I, I've got a friend actually who's just lost her father and we had dinner together a couple of nights ago. And it was really interesting to sort of realize that I know quite a lot about grief, but I also know nothing because when you're talking to somebody else who's just lost a parent, their experiences are so different. And um and I was I was sort of finding it weird that I was able to be so dry eyed about dad and, you know, 
someone who I love so much. I'm actually in his study right now. I've got a painting of him just up there, all of his rowing pictures um, around. And I'm, sur- I'm in his chair. I couldn't be more surrounded by him right now, which is a really lovely thing. And I think but the thing that's interesting that's sort of creeping in now around 10 years, because it'll be 10 years next year, is that sort of fear of forgetting and wanting to feel close to him and then thinking, well, why wasn't I crying when I was talking about the thing that always used to make me cry? And so it's interesting how grief is shifting and, and changing as the years go on. Absolutely. And I think that just listening to you talk, we recently sat down with the uh, LA Times and we were discussing points in emotion that come that feel delayed or, you know, when you're talking about strategy and going into work and just your schedule feeling really full and why didn't I cry then or or like just like the different ways that we process and at different rates too. And, you know, why were my eyes dry at that time? And I think it's just so personal, like when we allow ourselves, but also like when our body and mind is in a place where we're capable of processing that and feeling that, and it can be different for everybody. And they have those different gaps. Like some people just go into work mode for extended period of time. And then two years later, they're like, okay, now it's safe to go into that place or you know some of my other ducks are in a row so I find that really interesting because that's I interesting think, yeah yeah and then when you're watching somebody else grieve and and like you're uh hearing their experience we have like the tendency to kind of become a little you know judgy towards the way that we're processing like how come I'm not a mess like that or how come I'm mm-hmm. too much of a mess and this person mm-hmm. is really holding it all together and that's really unfair and it's unfortunate like I mean I understand how we have that perspective but I've heard that from so many people like why am I not impacted or even in the funeral experience in itself and how people navigate that and different family members and how that can cause a little bit of like friction between oh, like my yeah. sister didn't process it in the same way or why was she so put together or yeah and well yeah, rested yeah, of, course, and so of course there's lots of those little things and so I think it just brings us back to the space and not all of it we understand rate and mm. process and intensity and the volume control and all that but it, it mm. is really interesting a lot of people have shared that the difference there, highlighting and difference. I'm curious about when you talk about the writing and the the diary, I'm curious about your reflections on like, do you ever go back and look at your diary and feel like there's either um, points that you made in the, in the, in the diary that don't feel as pronounced or the other way, like things that happened in that journey that you didn't write about, or you admit it all together. And I know sometimes I look back at my diary and kind of line it up with like the timelines of my life. And I'm like, why did I skip that part? Or why did I take this? Um, It's interesting what we choose to write about. And so I'm curious about Mm. if you've had reflections on just that whole process. And in in kind of retrospect, if you if you felt like it was a a really accurate depiction of the road that you walked, Mm. or do you feel like, you know, you you left out some monumental pieces? That's a very interesting question. Yeah, I think um, the a few things there. Like, I think that, yeah, when, when sort of editing your own diary and you're sort of writing your story. And I think what I found very difficult was to allow the ugly bits in. I think, I think there was a sense of like the dad's last day, like the, like the kind of, you know, getting into a bad mood about the flannel that, that was, I was really ashamed about that. And I rewrote that section so many times. It was like, because I also didn't want to like my my mum was really stressed. Of course, my mum was really stressed because her husband was dying. Like, and and I think there's a sense in my family of kind of, or, or you know, not in my family necessarily with me of wanting things to be nice and pretty and kind of like tying it up with a nice ribbon. I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. I didn't want to tread on anyone's toes, and I also didn't really want to admit that I just left the hospital in a bad mood, like a teenager. So yeah, I think it was it was more the interpretation of what I'd written. I was frustrated by the sections where I hadn't written stuff down. But then I think there's those were precious moments at, at that time that I obviously shared with dad that I maybe didn't record, but I have in my, you know, they were lived moments. Um, and there was also, so there's also in the book around the time that dad, so that on the same trip that dad had a stroke, I was doing this short film and I ended up doing the short film, which is kind of a weird thing. But my brother and mum were like, look, stay there. It's awful here. You don't want to be here because it's terrible. Come back in a couple of days. We'll book you a flight. 
and then we'll really look forward to seeing you. So they sort of encouraged me to stay and do this short film because the whole sh- short film had been written for me by a friend and I was in Berlin and la la la. It's a weird situation. So I did this short film. God knows what my performance was like. You know, I don't think I've ever d- dared watch it actually. But everyone was speaking German. So I was in this kind of weird world. Everyone knew my dad had just had a stroke and everyone was doing that whole looking at me in a certain way. And I was again, weirdly dry eyed because in shock. And I don't know what a stroke, I mean, I know what a stroke is, but at that point, I didn't know what it literally meant for dad or what I was going to find. And so there was a lot going on in my mind about who I was going to find, what I was going to find. I wrote about that a lot in my book, actually, in the diary. But then I had this sort of like this sort of fling with this guy that I met on the short film that was hugely intense and like going on in parallel with what was going on with dad. And in a weird way, looking back, it actually was sort of like this energetic boost at a time when I was probably going to be quite broken. And actually this new, there was this new energy that came out. I described it like one power supply got pulled out and another one got plugged in. And anyway, that all ended terribly, obviously. And so that was, that was painful to write about too. And I was like, am I going to pretend that I was like, you know, if we imagine a sort of rom-com, I'm going to be the romantic hero and I'm going to be this sort of lovable, you know, hilarious sort of girl who, um, you know, hey, it wasn't my fault. He was a bad guy. It, but it really wasn't that. I think I was a complete mess. I was an absolute mess. Um, probably writing poetry as well. I mean, absolutely worst kind of nightmare. And that was awful. I was like, how how do I, you know, people are going to read this. How am I going to edit this? So again, I I, I had to find a balance between you know, really embarrassing myself and also being true to the hot mess that I was for, you know, quite a prolonged period of time. And I'm glad I was honest about stuff because people relate to it. And a lot of people have said to me, wow, it's very honest, your book, your book's very honest. And actually, I, I'm really glad that I, I was honest. It is very honest. It's a kind of, and there's some poems in there that were in parallel that weren't about grief, that were just about, you know, my brain and what a mess it was. And, um, Again, they're quite fragmented, a lot of them, but I, yeah, again, I could have left them out and I was really tempted to leave them out and I'm really glad I left them in. <laughs> you know what, I, I so appreciate your honesty about being being the mess and the impaired decision-making, we'll call it from your perspective. Decision-making. Um, yeah, and <laughs> just the, the, like, the fullness of it, of being in that whirlwind and the decisions that we make in that space and how we're kind of rounding out our experience. And I like your analogy of the, you know, one power source being unplugged and so, so very human that is to seek out like, you know, Meaning. an antidote to that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're like, this is, I was like, this has happened for a reason. My dad's dying and this man has appeared who's like going to be my savior. And this was my, that was the story. And it was like, that was the narrative. And like, how could this, you know, this is just meant to be. It's all in the stars. It's all like, yeah, how, you know, that's, we find, we're trying to find meaning and sort of like, especially in a desperate moment like that, where you feel so vulnerable. I think that's the thing about grief, especially losing a parent is, is that sort of, you know, that kind of protector figure, that person who makes, you know, makes everything okay, who contains you, who sort of keeps you propped up. It's so destabilizing and anxiety inducing and exposing. And, you know, no wonder it's something that we process a lot of us in private, you know, away from everyone, because it is such a small, you know, well, not small, it's a huge thing, but it's something that is so private. And, and, and you use the word safe earlier on that sort of needing to feel safe in order to grieve. And I think that's so true. But yeah, for me, it was uh, very much all about trying to find meaning and, and, and it's incredible with, with sort of, you know, nine years of, of hindsight to see how misguided one can be. And uh, I get it. I absolutely get it. But what a beautiful (laughs) spot for you to land, like you're saying, nine years later, like to land in the spot now where you have in the space now where you have like awareness of like, like you're saying, the stars aligned in that moment. You think, yes, this is like the the vibe. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is this, this is, is it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I relate to that so deeply. Like I, and I'm sure we all do in some capacity. But I think just, yeah, I've been there. You think you're making just this beautiful, brilliant decision, and then now it's just like what? Like you know, and but to and to not be so like like stiff upper lip about it. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Allowing yourself to the like forgiveness in that space. Those feelings are so intense and that experience is so intense. Then it's like, well, of course you would. 
Like, why wouldn't you do that? Mm, and so mm, mm, creating mm. that softness towards yourself around it. And I can really feel humor too on your behalf in saying, you know, like what a mess that was, like the candid humor about that. And so I think that lightness too helps us yeah. just move forward. And I'm sure lots of people who are listening to this can relate to that beautiful <laughs> Uh, like nightmarish mess, you know, it's, it's, that's how you want to frame it up. But yeah. so many of us have had that in our moments of grief, for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy so, you wrote I'm about so it. Reassured to hear that. And it was actually, yeah. that was a really lovely thing about the writing process is having an editor who I could talk to about these things. And I'd be like, this poem, you know, that she, that they'd be like, there's a, good, there's a little gap here. You're holding back here. There's something missing that you haven't put in. And actually it was called out on that occasion. I was like, it's because it's horribly embarrassing and I don't want to write about it. And they were like, just make a joke of it. Like, you're like, it's fun. It's funny. You can look back on it and, and laugh about it. And it's true. And it's amazing how you can kind of take ownership of your own trauma by like seeing the lightness in it. And, well, and also um, how much power there is in that space. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because so much yeah. of it is like, the feeling of like, oh, the judgment or people around me feel a certain way about. And it's like, it's just so empowering to say, yep, these are my decisions. Some of them were crazy. <laughs> and this is where I'm landing. Like, so then like, there's nothing left for anyone really to discuss or make, no, it, make anything about it. Because that's, the, that's the end of it. This is the beginning and end. So I've continuously done that my whole life and uh something that you know me and Joshua talk about a lot like just if you're just candid with it like what what else is there left for anyone that judgment piece is just gone because it's yeah, like it's true no one's going to judge me more than I've already judged myself for my yeah. wrongdoings yeah, so, yeah, oh, yeah. beautiful I yeah. totally I totally agree and it's interesting I think the thing that's interesting about grief is the like I, f- I feel like the feeling of grief is as intense as it ever was when it comes, when it when it sort of rises up, sometimes unexpectedly, but it's more spaced out now, I'd say. It's something that I find difficult when people ask me about, like, do you feel sad that your father didn't meet your children? And Because my mum is like such a huge part of my life and my husband's parents are like a huge part of our lives. And there's this sort of missing piece that they they never got to know. And Again, like I, that, that's something that's like a new wave. I think you sort of get these new waves of grief that come in. Oh God, I thought I dealt with all of that, but now I've got these new things and, you know, um, things that they're missing out on. And yeah, so I think that's kind of 10 years going into 10 years. That's sort of the next thing. And I have a friend who, who likes to use the senses as a way of reconnecting it's actually in my book at the end of my book I got friends to reflect on where they were in their grief journey one year on 10 years on 30 years on and it's really interesting to see how it changes and what people you know reflect on and yeah my friend who's at 10 years which I'm approaching was talking about the fear of forgetting and wanting to have you know her mum's perfume she keeps it in her drawer she keeps her music you know close and so when she's feeling that, you know, the, the the vision is slipping a little bit, she kind of sprays the perfume, she listens to the music. And I love that idea of leaning on the senses. And I was actually just Googling my dad's aftershave, which I remembered is a Chanel uh, Pour Monsieur, which is a 70 pound bottle of, uh, uh, maybe I'll treat myself <laughs> just for those moments. I love it. That's just such a great way to continue <laughs> bonds and stuff. Like I... I start spraying you know, it on my husband. He'll be like, what yes. are you doing? <laughs> Just wear it. <laughs> Don't ask any questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but it's like, you know, like, in, in those first moments of grief, I don't know, like I, me and Joshua have talked about this. I don't know if you had this, but like when you lose somebody, it's like you go into like this emergency recovery mode and you try to like pull up all these memories because you don't want to forget. And you're like trying to file them and organize them. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. like this feeling of desperation of like, quick, yeah. let me remember everything I can possibly remember. And yeah, of and course. Senses and food you ate together. And, you know, I would have like driving in the car, like, we always listen to this like family friend of mine that passed away, you know, my whole life and so close to my family. And we'd drive in the car and we'd listen to The Edge, which is like a Toronto radio station. And he would just sing like he knew all the words to every song and alternative rock. And we would just drive and listen to the radio. And it's just like, so yeah, so after like he passed away, I would always just want to listen to that radio station. And mm. it would just 
put me into like a, a, a weep, you know, and you're like foraging memories like crazy. And yeah, sometimes that a lot of people talk about scents and stuff and like using, mm. finding the perfume and, mm. and all that. It's just such an interesting way to like, you know, continue the bond. And if you can afford the Chanel, then do it. I can like, just get myself you know I mean? the Chanel. But it's interesting. <laughs> like my dreams, I remember when my dad died, because it's because it's 10 years ago. I, I don't remember specific dreams I had around the time. But what I do remember is how the scent, they were very sensorially rich. And I remember like my dad used to wear a lot of cashmere, like the softest jumpers. And I've still got one actually that I was, you know, that I kind of occasionally pull out and have a cry on. And for a long time, it smelled of him. And I had this other thing of his that it smelled of him. And then it accidentally went in the wash. And that was awful because it was just that smell, that kind of, you know, washing powder mixed with kind of dad, mixed with a bit of the dog, mixed with like uh, just, just his general, you know, a bit of coffee mixed in there. But just this gorgeous smell and Oh, poor monsieur of course and then um yeah I remember sort of the, the sort of being held by him and the kind of softness of his jumpers and the the smell it was that very sensorially rich dream and then then the sort of devastation of the realization when you wake up that I just remember having so many of those dreams just and being in floods of tears often in the middle of the night waking up and because in those early days you know it's just so raw and it hasn't sunk in and so that whole having to deal with that reality all over again when you wake up, it's just, just, oh, just awful, awful. And I haven't had one like that for a long time, actually. I think it's interesting. So you didn't write any of the dreams down in your diary? No, because after dad died, I stopped writing my diary. The day sort of, uh, there was the funeral um, and I wrote about the funeral and what that was like. And I wrote about a poem about spring, which again is like probably a massive cliche, but like it, dad died in the winter. And then when spring came and like literally the, the ground under our feet became firmer, it was like this extraordinary thing of like regeneration and birds tweeting and like, you know, green, lush towpaths popping up. And I've never experienced the sense that, you know, my the, the seasons in such a meaningful way as I did after dad died. And I was living here um, with my mum for a while um, in the countryside. And so I was experiencing the, you know, nature in a kind of full on way. And we were walking the dog every day. And I, I'd been walking the dog every day in the winter when it was biting cold. And then, yeah, the seasons changed and it became spring. And so I wrote about that a lot. And again, that became a, quite a nice way to bookend the book to sort of that's sort of right at the end, um, that poem. And then I just stopped writing. I didn't want to write anymore. I kind of put the book away and then haven't kept a diary sort of ever since. So yeah, I didn't record any dreams. And I but but I I did have many of them. Um and the the one I had most recently um about dad, which wasn't a sort of a sensorial one, it wasn't about being held or anything. And I didn't wake up upset. It was a kind of just a very lovely dream. Was I was at a nightclub of some kind and there were lots of different rooms and I was trying to work out how I was going to get home. And I, and my dad was in a room with loads of other people sitting in a deck chair with a newspaper and he was there to take me. home. <laughs> and all I knew was that he was just there. And it was, just, it, I love the fact that it kind of, it's a reflection of how far I've come. I think that it was just cool. Dad was just there. He was going to take me home. He was just reading his paper and he was there, you know, he was just, you know, there for me and when I was ready to leave he was going to drive me home and he always used to come and pick me up whenever I go to parties he always sort of practically didn't want me to go be like do you want me just to take you home now I could just take me back in the car he was quite protective but he would always be there outside the pub or you know outside a party to, to pick me up and so it was quite nice that he was sort of still there in his deck chair I'm not sure why he was in a deck chair in a nightclub and sort of overlooked that oh my god that's probably, probably doing a crossword I imagine um <laughs> That's nice. And it's nice to sort of, I guess, like talk about some of these these dreams because it's nice to hear some of the stories that go along with them, right? Because they are based yeah. a lot on like our longings, our memories, and some things that when we talk about like not wanting to forget these dreams, even though they may be kind of sometimes crazy or maybe you don't remember the full details, there's some of the feelings you do and it can bring up some of those memories and like his mm. clothes and the mm. smell and some things mm. that we, you know, we wouldn't normally talk about or think about. It sort of can bring that up, like him yeah. always being there before the party. Like, I love yeah. that. And I think that's the beauty of why I love talking about these dreams is I get to know their bond in a different way and your relationship yeah. in a different and, and way. Yeah. And, and that's, that's it. Like that would be, that sums it up so well. Like dad was, he was such a kind of, um, you know, he'd do anything for me. Like my parents live 
two hours outside of London, but he'd sort of offered to drive me home on a Sunday night. You know, it wouldn't be a thing. He'd be like, oh, of course I'll drive you home. Just drive you four hours. <laughs> well, actually for you guys living in Canada, that's probably nothing. That's probably like popping to the shops. But um, but here, um, you know, that feels like quite a big distance, but he'd do it in a heartbeat. He'd be like, oh, of course, I'll, you know, you've forgotten something, I'll drive it back. Or, um, and so he was, and he was always sort of very much someone I'd lean on, uh, you know, when I needed advice. And he was just such a sort of wonderful, protective father that, yeah, him waiting in a deck chair to take me home is is it really. That sort of sums it all up. It was interesting. My, my husband had a dream about dad shortly after we, well, must have been a good deal after we met. But he knew that my dad liked to play chess and he played chess a lot with my brother. And Billy had a dream where he and dad had a game of chess and, and dad was, and, and sorry, Billy was like, here, here you are. I'm finally getting to meet you. And they had a game of chess. And he was like, it was just this really lovely dream that he had. And I kind of felt obviously really sad that, you know, they never met each other, these two huge people in my life. And Billy came along, you know, quite soon after dad died, actually, like a year later. But they had this dream. And so sort of weirdly in my head, they sort of met each other in a kind of weird, you know, dreamland. That's so amazing. So beautiful, too. Isn't that because, lovely? Yes. Wow. Just a gentle dream. I'm not sure a lot happened. They just played a game of chess. Yeah, there was bonding. I'm not sure who won. They just bonded. They sat there together. It, was, it wasn't about winning or losing. <laughs> it wasn't about exactly. winning or losing. Even though so, both of them were quite competitive. Um, no, it was just, it was, a, it was a really lovely just thing. And my mum, I was talking to my mum earlier on about her dreams about dad. And she was saying that she had a lot of dreams where they would be having these conversations about plans. And we go, we're going to do this and we do that. And then she'd be like, oh no, you're dead. Oh no, we can't, we can't do that because you're dead. And they'd be sort of talking and then they both sort of realize, oh no, we can't, you know, which again feels like a kind of gentle letting go, kind of like a way of, I don't know, one foot in the future and one foot in the reality of like her situation. It's quite sort of lovely that she's kind of kept seeing him in these dreams and they'd keep talking about the plans that they had. And then, oh no, oh no, you're dead. Um, yeah sweet I hadn't I didn't know that until today actually until I asked her about it interesting that type of dream is very very common lots of people have that yeah lots of people have that yeah same thing planning for for stuff and then just yeah. the, the, the realization that oh that's not happening or you're not here or no no yeah yeah I mean because it's where you're processing isn't it these dreams are where you're you know your subconscious just kind of trying to make sense of everything yeah, there's a lot of theory. Well, there's a lot of theories on like maybe what they are and how they how they help us. But yeah, one for sure is it's helping with the processing of our grief in one way or another. If someone believes it's a visitation or not, it doesn't really matter. It's still processing something that mm-hmm. you're you're working through, and you're you're you've sort of talked about how challenging that is. And so there's mm-hmm. something that is I think trying to help us you know, really work through some of that pain, even recover memories. I know people who they they had that same thing with um, wanting to remember not being able to remember a lot of the memories that they had, but then they had these dreams were the actual memories of the past that they sort of forgot about and would come up. So they sort of get that kind of healing and that, that reduce that kind of distress. But I think it's, it's great to be honest about grief and about what happens. And I think, you know, as you said, it's, it can be uncomfortable, but it's amazing how many people experience some of the similar things you do. And dreams is one of those things. And dreaming of the deceased is one of the things that we're trying to just raise awareness on because people don't normally ask those questions, but most people are having these dreams and it's like some are, can be very positive and cathartic. Other ones can be very devastating and traumatic. And so it's just really like just talking about what Go, is going on at night and not being like ashamed of what what's going on and, and that mm. and so I think it's beautiful that you did ask your mom because not many people probably asked her about her dreams yeah and do, do you so you think do you think that these dreams um like it could be a visitation is that something that that is thought as well like that it's a kind of connection with that person that they're kind of coming to check in on you or that you're in this sort of parallel grief dreamland sort of with them again like what do you guys think about that what's interesting about what you would expect from dreams is that they should be negative right like Mm. with our knowledge of dream research and trauma dreams that when someone's dealing with so much heartache and distress you're more likely going to have these negative dreams but people are more likely having these positive dreams which goes against some of the research so there's something else going on 
That's a interesting of, because obviously anxiety dreams are often quite negative. Like you'd have, right. if you're feeling anxious about things, obviously I'm an actor. I've had a huge amount of anxiety dreams about teeth falling out and not being able to remember my lines and being on stage. Like, awful like they are not positive dreams um so it's an interesting thing i've never thought about that but obviously grief is a devastating thing but because i suppose it's built on love it's like you know that the the dreams aren't always negative yeah and so it's really just interesting to sort of see that and, we're, and you never really know what's going on but a lot of people do believe that many of these dreams um especially the positive ones are visitations and wow. it's really exploring that for them i know i've talked to people who were an atheist prior and they started having these dreams and now they've realized that there must be something else because they're so different and vivid than other dreams and i think it's fascinating the human experience on how these dreams can shape us into our beliefs and our perspectives. Um, and at cross culturally, you sort of see that, and whatever you believe spiritually tends to show up in those types of dreams to almost help with whatever your view of the afterlife is. But the core mm. message is the same is that love is present and love is still here. And so it's very, I think it's it's one of those unknown questions and it's really based on the dreamer. Yeah. Love is love. What did you say? Love is love, love is love here. Is, love is here. Yeah. Yeah. Love is present. That's such a lovely thing to. And we forget, I think, you know, like with grief, it's there's so much pain. We forget mm -hmm. that love can even be a part of that world again uh, in that form um, <laughs> where it's that positive. But like the grief is is coming from that, but it doesn't mean that the love is gone. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's in there, but it's just different now. It's just finding yeah. your way back. And that's just what you're saying is that you're not having those deep, depressing moments as you once were, or those maybe those really deep, cries that you once were and they come out in different times it doesn't mean your mm. grief is ever gone it just means that you know no, moment just... it's going to come up and same thing with love yeah. like, you just got to find the right circumstances and be patient and it'll show itself and you're like oh okay because one of the fears <laughs> one of the fears is that like it's never going to come back like, that's when mm. my dad died that's what was one of the things that really popped through my head that this is just how i'm going to feel the rest of my life and mm. i have to accept that and it's not true and these dreams showed me that and changed me you know, with that. So it's just like, but this is the human experience, right? And that's why I love talking about it, because we can have these misinterpretations of what the world's going to be now and in the future. And a lot of times it's not true. And the more we hear these stories, the more we realize, mm -hmm. oh, okay, like some of the thoughts that we're thinking may be inaccurate. And so there's there's this hope and there's this direction that, you know, like there is things that are going to change and continue to change. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And just mm. having that support to be able to talk about that stuff with and your concerns. And it's, there's something beautiful about that. As you said, there's something beautiful about hearing the the podcast, the grief cast, right? So being able to hear the stories of other people um, was actually therapeutic for you and and helped you. It in was, the process. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's hope, isn't it? It's hope that you're gonna you're gonna be okay. Like, like I, I've written the thing, you know, when people's parents have died. I, since my own father died, like I, I think the thing I've often said is like I, I wish it didn't hurt. I really, really wish it didn't hurt. I, I wish I could tell you it wasn't going to hurt, but it hurts like hell. But you know, it's you've got to wade through it. You have to kind of just go through it one day at a time, one minute at a time, and you know, you you will feel lighter. You know, it will, it will. You won't always feel like this, but you. I think Julia Samuels, who's an amazing grief therapist over here I think she talks about it almost like a storm that you have to weather and um that, you know and you're being changed by it grief is changing you and in order to be changed in order to come through you just have to feel it but then it's so hard to do that isn't it it's like the last thing you want to do and you want to run away or you know have a bad fling with someone or just do anything apart from feel <laughs> feel it um but you have to feel it you have to feel it and no wonder it's creeping into dreams because it's that time when you can't control you know you're, you're not you're not able to suppress and it's interesting because um, a lot of people will love to talk about your traumatic breakup or your relationship yeah. but when you bring up grief people are like i don't know <laughs> yeah so yeah just... yeah like always oh, feels a bit uncomfortable <laughs> yeah change the subject yeah which is why I think those of us who have experienced grief love talking about it. It's such, it's so like, I feel like I've made some amazing friends like in the last 10 years, like there's some real soul people that I've connected with over grief. And actually a number of them um, contributed to the book, but there's a sort of shorthand that exists. There's a kind of, it's just a sort of rapid bond. And I, and I like to think of the parents, the sort of dead parents upstairs, kind of pulling the strings and sort of nudging you together, going, go be friends with that one. Go on. Yeah. That one over there in the green jumper. 
they'll be good for you you can talk and I like I, I really feel like that I, I do still continue to think of dad slightly pulling strings upstairs and sort of nudging these people into my life very interesting you say that I actually have do you feel I the feel same the, I feel the exact same way and uh my parents are here so it's not my parents per se but I know like even with um we've had like 200 guests on on this show and wow. we've been doing this for over five years and wow. so different things that I am experiencing just thoughts I have and then it's like the guests often speak to like internal thoughts I have or elaborate or provide insights on things that I've just kind of been mulling over independently. And so I feel like the timing of guests and who's on and their walk of life and their story like always connects to like yeah, your it's journey impeccable. Is. Yes. And I, you know, the guest would never really know that per se. Uh, sometimes I share it, but sometimes I don't. But some of the things have been so like profound that I end up, I like always cry on this show, but oh. I end up having um, <laughs> these meltdowns, like just these big responses to people's story and their journey and certain things they say. It's just like, oh, it just gets me right in the heart. And then I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm a mess for a couple hours after. Like I, you know, I'm like, okay, hey, I got to get back to work. <laughs> or like, I think yeah. Too. But, yeah. So then I always wonder, like, hey, like something's orchestrating the timing of this. And same as you, like I've met such beautiful friends doing this and all our grief activities we've done, our research and stuff. So it just the timing, see, it feels like a gift to me, like a spiritual, mm. emotional gift to me. And it keeps on giving. And, the, and mm. then the people you meet, they're just like, so inspiring. And, and like when you talk mm. about the hope and like allowing you to push through because the grief has been like relentless, you know? Yeah. 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 It is. It is. And, and every time you have those big, you know, res, you know, those moments that resonate and those big cries, you're sort of nudging further on in your, you're sort of eking out these different corners of this huge, you know, massive thing. I mean, it's so huge. It's yeah. And I guess these people are giving you confidence or they're giving you just that little bit of insight. You need to get that little bit further on in your journey and you just keep nudging along and not trying to do too much or, you know, process too much at a time, just just nudging on baby steps. It's kind of what it's all about, isn't it? But I love that you feel that too. I really do. And I feel like I lost someone here, but I feel like I have someone upstairs, you know, he's got my back. He better have my back up there. Well, it seems like that's what you're, you know, you talked about that dream you recently had. It's very similar. Yeah. It's like there's someone there protecting you and waiting for you and, and watching out for you whenever yeah. you need that ride home, right? So it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's just part of that. His texture. <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely, actually. We went on holiday this this last week to Wales, uh, which is a place we used to go on family holidays when I was a child. And it's amazing how doing certain things can also connect you. Like I went for a swim in the morning before breakfast, which is something my dad would have been very impressed with or would have done himself, but bathe before breakfast, a BBB, he would have called it. And I had a BBB and it was one of those amazing pure moments of just like, you know, yeah, connecting with him in a sort of way of thinking this is something he would have done. This is something he would be proud of. Swimming in the Welsh Sea, the whole beach to myself. And um, I'm going to try and do more and more of that kind of stuff, I think, as I get, yeah. I get older. And so this has been a great conversation. I'm said like really enjoying hearing your story and also reflecting on my journey through. Yeah, it's been lovely talking to you. And so one of our last questions. Yeah. Yeah. One of our last questions we like to ask all our guests is if you could have a dream tonight of someone who has died, could be your father, what Mm -hmm. would that dream look like to you? Oh, that's a lovely question. I would dream about well this is something I've imagined in my mind I would dream that I was here in this house and I would imagine there's a little tent in the garden and two little chairs in front of the tent and my dad would be pottering around the garden with a watering can with my daughter who's three she'd have a little watering can and they'd be watering the plants together and then they'd go up to the fence and they'd look out over the cows and the sheep in the field and then they'd go to the tent and they'd sit there and he'd read her a story and I'd watch them pottering around together in the garden. That would be the best dream. 
because I've imagined that so much because I saw him do that with my nieces and nephews and he was never someone who sort of made a big fuss with children he'd just be very natural and he would get them involved with what he was doing that was his way of doing things like right we're going to sort out the the stationery and uh, or we're going to go in the garden and we're going to you know do some he just get them involved in whatever his activity was and people you know they loved it and I really like oh god I just wish they'd yeah got to meet him but um that would be my dream yeah beautiful your your father sounds so lovely and chic and um, (laughs) just yeah really appreciate all the he sounds like a really really lovely person and yeah just appreciate everything you you shared I love your dream it descriptive and yeah it's it's a beautiful kind of landscape there so thank you for sharing that and I hope you are gifted with that dream tonight that would be just great (laughs) thank you so much guys it's been so lovely to talk to you yeah, we appreciate. I think this is a different uh, talking about spring and talking about writing. The episode before this is also a writer and she talked about regeneration of springtime and how it relates to grief. So some parallels there, a little bit of like a theme series. And so that's come up a little bit in the past little bit. Yeah, people, you know, share those insights and there's some commonalities there. So just really beautiful. I really enjoyed this conversation and oh, just so you. grateful of the openness to come on. And, and so listeners, if they could, if you could just give us some insights around how they could find you, if they're interested in getting connected or have some feedback around um, some of the things you share today, can you just, yeah, uh, let us absolutely. Know? Yeah. I'm, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter um, at Emily Grace Bevan. And I'd, yeah, I'd love to connect with anyone there. They can find me there. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I do want to say, I know your daughter's never met your father. But it doesn't mean that these dreams can't be a connection to that. We've had a guest on that never met her father. He died when she was in the womb. But she started having these dreams of of him after the fact. Mm -hmm. And um, they developed a bond. So I could see the same thing happening with your daughter to to your own father. Oh, that's so lovely. So it's just like understanding that, you know, I would ask. And as they grow up, just ask and see what happens. Because it's a very beautiful process that can happen when we're asleep. She actually said to me the other day, we were talking, she said, who's your daddy? Because we've talked about Nick and she's aware of this figure called Nick. And I remember she once said, Uncle Nick. I was like, it's not your uncle. She was like, Uncle Nick's not home. She was trying to understand. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Uncle Nick's not at home. Then the other day she was like, who's your daddy? I said, my daddy's died. My daddy, my daddy's dead. His body stopped working and and he's dead. And she's like, oh, I miss him. (laughs) It was so sweet. I just was like, yeah, I miss him too. It was so lovely to see like a child try and process it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Aww. Well, we wish Thank you, you guys. All, all the best in your journey moving forward. We didn't talk lovely. much about your career, but whatever. Um, it's full Monty on Hulu. It's on Hulu. Yeah. I think I come in around episode four. Okay. Um, but um, yeah. yeah, that's one that will be out soon. Brilliant. I'm going to watch it. Thanks for the oh, tip. There. Thanks so I much, guys. That. Yeah. And we hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, guys. All the best. Bye.